relationship-based business and, you know, given emails and that kind of communication, do you think clients' expectations and that relationship is the same as it was back then? Oh, clients' emails, and I should, I should confess this because everybody in the office, in the room who might know me knows this, I don't know how to work a computer. I can't even work an iPhone. I lost my phone a few weeks ago. I don't know where it is. So they thought they, that was the moment that they could sick an iPhone on me. I tried it for a week. I said, my six-year-old grandson can probably do this, but I cannot do this. So I found myself a, a Razor-type phone. Um, what was the question? I slightly... Just the re <laughs> relationships and how... Um, they may have changed the years with the way communication well, has changed. Oh, well, yeah, clients used to call you in the middle of the night. Now they email you <laughs> from wherever they are. And they're usually not in, 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 uh, uh, in another part of Manhattan or in California or someplace like that. They're sitting in some hotel, 12 hours dime difference in, in Bangkok or wherever, and they say, oh, my god, this bathroom is so fantastic. Um, and they describe it to you in detail. And they send you a photograph from there. Fortunately, they don't show you what they look like in the bathroom. <laughs> Happy to say. Um, uh, so there's that, and there's an expectation that everything will be done so much faster. Right. Uh, but that's all right, because I'm rather an impatient person. So um, moving as long so, faster is okay with me. So speed works for you. Speed works for me. Okay. Talk to me about 42nd Street. Oh, 42nd Street was, of course, a turning point, not only for us, but I would say for the city of New York. Uh, 42nd Street in the 80s, we were hired to do a study on whether the theaters, as the highest concentration of, quote, legitimate, that is, live action theaters, still with stages and prosceniums and fly towers, if any place in the, in the world in, 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 in a concentrated area. Um, the theaters were derelict. Um, some of you are old enough to remember uh, that they would, were showing action movies and pornographic movies. And they, really the effort of the of people who owned the theaters was to run them down as much as possible in the hopes that they would get torn down and eventually would be redeveloped as commercial office space or something like that. Uh, the city tried to redevelop 42nd Street. It, it went through many different alternate schemes with help from the Ford Foundation, so forth. And that, they started, those efforts started in the early 80s. It was an extremely unpopular plan to tear down uh, the Times Tower, the then Times Tower, and to replace it with a plaza and have four giant towers by my friend Philip Johnson. And we were hired to, uh, as well as Hugh Hardy, to study the theaters and see what their potential for use is. I mean, they were so, you could only go into the theaters between 8 and 10 in the morning when they cleaned out the nighttime crowd and uh, before the daytime crowd came in. And one time, someone in my office went in to survey the theaters, just to survey them. They went in, the lights went on in the theater, and they found a guy dead on the floor. I mean, he just died at the theater. Supposedly, if they hadn't turned the lights on, they might, he might have still been there. Um, anyhow, that happened, and then nothing happened. And then we, with Tibor Kalman, the great designer, uh, were interviewed in around 1990 or 91. The city was, by that time, by the way, 42nd Street, and, and it's probably all, you all probably all know this, but 42nd Street had been so bruised and battered, you see the movie Taxi Driver and so forth, actually the state had begun to board up all the properties. They took them over through um, condemnation procedures. 42nd Street was, had become the safest street in the world. Nobody was there but German tourists coming to photograph the decline of the greatest city in the world. It was empty of people. Nobody wanted to walk there. People from the Port Authority bus terminal would use other streets to get to their office destination. It was a disaster. The city and state then decided uh, to take over. Unfortunately, Governor Cuomo, then Governor, the f Governor won Cuomo, um, was not really interested in the project, but he had a man named Vincent Teasy, who really was, and they realized that they had to do something. So we did an interim plan. We were hired to do an interim plan. And we were doing that, working on that in, 
1992 and 93, and the idea of this interim plan was to fix up the stores. People would lease them for 10 or 15 years, and maybe something would happen. But a miracle happened. So it wasn't me. Um, it was the millennium. First of all, Disney was looking for a theater, and I knew about that. And um, they had refused to be on 42nd Street. Maybe my involvement helped them to turn the corner, but they took over in a very favorable way. The new Amsterdam Theater and completely restored it, and it's a great uh, thing. Um, then the millennium was coming, and suddenly, A, all these companies who follow each other like kindergarten children, oh, Disney's there, must be good. So Rebecca Robertson, who was working on the project for the state, who had been calling every company that would be likely to come to 42nd Street and never being able to get anybody important to even take her calls, her phone started to jump off the hook as soon as Disney was interested. It's a very interesting phenomenon. And why? Because the millennium was coming and they were realizing, these companies, all in the media business, that the focus of the millennium, the ball coming down in Times Square, was going to be intense uh, at the year 2000. And so they mad scrambled to come to 42nd Street. So suddenly our interim plan um, was jettisoned, basically. But the principles behind the plan were kept. And um, I'm very proud of that plan because it's probably the only plan written in, by an architect uh, that is not in favor of good taste. It's, it's bad taste is written into the plan. I mean, what architects think of as bad taste. That is to say, for example, it says you have to have a sign. We, we measured all the signs that had existed, and we said you have to have signs that could be the same size as the signs that were there before or bigger. And then they, with the Municipal Arts Society, we measured the light levels. And the light levels were dim by this point because there was almost nobody on the street. But there were still some shop signs. And so that was, you could have it that bright or brighter. So uh, normally, the development controls are saying, no, no, you must have little Helvetica letters, very tasteful on the door, like Rockefeller Center. And everything must be dim and so forth. This is the opposite. Well, once you've, uh, the capitalist marketplace hears that they can do anything they want to advertise themselves, they went crazy. And that was exactly what we wanted. And we knew we had a tremendous success when Con Edison called the state and said, you know, there are so many lights going in to Times Square and 42nd Street that our power grid is not designed to take this. We have to develop a whole new power grid for Midtown, for that area. We knew we had a hit. So that was a tremendous successful project. Um, uh, it, it represented a, a kind of interest that I had in popular culture, in, in the movies, in Hollywood, and entertainment, um, and connected to my interests and my role in Disney. So that's a, that was a turning point project, but it, not in a turning point like 20 other 42nd Streets came my way. There are no other 42nd Streets. It was unique, but really amazing. So that answer that, your question? That does. Thank okay. you very much. So let's talk about your role as the dean. You know, having a thriving 250-person practice, which you've said, you know, you can only do with great partners. What, you've been there since 1998. What, what does that feed in you? Well, I, I went to architecture school at Yale. I got a lot out of it. Mm -hmm. So I, and I've always, and I taught for 28 years at Columbia. I love teaching. I think everybody who is a professional, whatever profession, has an obligation to give back. I think too many architects don't, or other professionals don't. Um, I'm, 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 not, I'm not sure I'm that good a teacher, but I'm, I am, as was said before, I am uh, outspoken. I'm fearless. And um, uh, students come up to me 25 years later and they say, you know, you were right on my jury. I can't remember the student. I can't remember what I said. <laughs> They remember me saying if something was not quite right on their project or whatever, I mean, getting into an argument with a fellow juror or whatever. Anyhow, uh, I was delighted to come back to Yale uh, as a dean. Um, the school needed a strong leader. OK, I'm a strong leader. It was a good chance to give more room to my partners to take more responsibility so that we hope our firm will go on after the great bus hits me. Um, 
uh, that's the intention at least. And um, I had a wonderful opportunity and a very supportive president of the university, Rick Levin, just stepping down to um, uh, rebuild a school in which Yale has some financial means to allow that to happen. And I am the dean at Yale, it's a school that is um, largely run by the dean. I mean, we do have a faculty, we do consult them, but the dean has a, a many, it's a, it's a strong dean model, let's put it that way. And I used it to the fullest. Right. <laughs> and um, so it's been fun. And it's been a great education for me because I made what it, it was been good and bad. I said, because the faculty and, and the uh, dean before me did not always go to the public lectures and things like that in the school. So I made a pledge to myself, but I did tell people eventually that I would go to every event. Well, now we have so many events. I mean, I sometimes screaming with pain, one more lecture I have to go to, <laughs> one more set of slides but to look at, but, but it's been very interesting. So anyhow, I enjoy it. And I said I'm gonna do it three more years at the end of this year, which will be, so I'll have done it assuming I bodily survive uh, for 18 years. That's a long time. long time. One more year than Bernard Schumi did it at Columbia, though. That's the old point of it. <laughs> Is that your motivation? <laughs> well, I, I wanna open this up to the audience who wanna ask you some questions, but before I do, last question. What's the legacy you'd like to leave? Well, I think, uh, um, on his tombstone should say he did good work. He took no prisoners. <laughs> he made it possible for more good work to happen in the future. How's that? That's great. I made that up. Thank you, Bob. <coughs> so we're, we want to open it up to you. I think the easiest thing to do is there are mics on either side. If you have a question, it would come up and um, pose a question to Bob. So. Or you can, if you can yell it loud enough, you can do that as well. I have a question, uh, actually to Bob. Uh, how often do you find your uh, goals as a designer competing with your goals as a businessman? How do you um, choose which goals take priority? Uh, and sort of when do you make sacrifices for one versus the other? And then the second question is. Oh, two questions. <laughs> the second question is, do you think there's such thing as an ideal firm size, and why? Um, well, the, the second question is easier enough to answer. I don't think there's an ideal firm size, but going back to what I said earlier, when, when I was advised by Paul Rudolph that 30 or so was the right size, clearly that's not the case. Um, if you want to do uh, work of any size, um, uh, and if you want to practice internationally or globally. Um, as I, I'm a terrible businessman. I, I forgot to mention that. I'm actually not interested in business. Um, I, oh, I had a, a, a partner named Robert Buford who ran our office for 20 years. And uh, he saw that people didn't kill each other in, in the office and managed contracts and stuff like that. And I'm a very good delegator and I'm trusting of people and it worked out fine. I, um, of course, you make decisions in relationship I suppose to clients who wish, you, see, you don't want to, I mean, standing there and drawing a line in the sand is kind of dumb. But um, uh, you try to listen to a client, and if the client, I mean, there's a way to fire a client, by the way, I should tell you that, in a nice way. Um, there's a bad way, which is have a temper tantrum, scream and yell and leave, but that's not very good. You, the other uh, nice, you can give out a kind of scent, like a skunk or something. You just sort of <laughs> subtly, the client gets to realize that you're not interested in the client. And that's a way to solve some problems where people don't have enough money. And we sometimes have to tell clients that their dreams are not managed by their, matched by their pocketbooks. I mean, it's true. But more and more as we get more established as architects, and um, I, we, people have, kind of self-screen themselves, whether it's private clients or corporate clients or whatever, they know what, what to expect coming to our office. But I think making business decisions, yes, you have to, you know, you have to meet payroll, nice to give people a bonus every now and again, all those kinds of things, but 
You can't put that as the absolute, especially when you're beginning your practice. You have to really establish your bona fides as someone of, sort of with integrity who will stick with it and uh, make some sacrifices. Thank you. <coughs> Other questions? Tom. If there are no more questions, we can go home early, which is okay <laughs> with me. I have one more one. Can you talk a teeny bit about uh, project development, getting jobs, and specifically about your books and how you think those have helped? Maybe in your history books, has that helped grow your practice? Do you, do you measure that? Can you measure that? that uh, we should repeat the question. Well, I'll repeat that question. The question is, uh, 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 well, in at least one part of the question is, have the publications that we've produced, and some are history books that I've written with other uh, people and, uh, uh, and others are uh, documenting rather elaborately and meticulously the work of the office as it's evolved over the years, um, have been helped to get projects? And the answer is yes. Um, all those books have been written um, uh, as expenses of the firm in that sense. We don't ever expect to make any money on the books. Um, and I do the history books because I like to do them. And I'm very happy when people seem to appreciate them. And I think that I'm identified with some people for them. And we send them out um, as Christmas presents, OK? Uh, um, uh, the books that document our work, uh, I spend a lot of time writing the text. Um, and we um, organize the work. Some of them are completely on the model of Le Corbusier's complete works, which inspired every young architect of my generation, where you put in everything. You know, he recorded every drawing, every every scheme he did, built and unbuilt. And then sometimes we've done ones on houses, which have a specific uh, point of view, or on uh, other building types. Most recently, on campus buildings. So they are, I hope interest to people, but I suppose they don't, I don't think they do us any harm about getting us projects. Uh, there are lots of other ways we, we developed. I mean, there are some partners, and I know one of them is in the audience tonight, who always tells me I'm, we're way behind everybody else. We don't flicker, we don't um, <laughs> Twitter. We, we don't Twitter. I, I mean, we may do that, but I don't do it in any case. And, um, and so forth in our our website wasn't good enough, so we did it over again. And then somebody else says it's not good enough yet. I mean, you do all those things. I, I think they don't hurt. They're good. Communication is very important. Architects are not good at communicating, by the way. First of all, most architects, unless they go to Yale or Columbia, don't know how to write. That's the first problem with architects. And I won't even go with designers. They don't know how to write clearly. Everybody should take courses in writing. How to express yourself. And also, you know, I, I mean, I, maybe I'm not a good example of it, but I think I'm pretty good on the platform. And you often get people on the platform who don't have any, think, they have lots of interesting things to say, but they can't get it out. Or when they're presenting their work, they stand with their back to the people they're presenting to, and they're pointing to the work up there. So, so those are all things that help you to get, get uh, work um, and to get yourself known. And I mean, I am not interested in business in the sense of sitting down and you know figuring out how much money we lost on one project or another, although I like to win. Um, by the way, in case you don't understand that, I like to win. Um, but, um, uh, but I am interested in, con in conveying my passions um, and the passions of our partnership to the widest possible public. So I did a television series in the 80s. And if I can bore you with one more story, um, I, I didn't go after doing this television series. We had a client for a little renovation of a house in East Hampton. And the husband of the client, she, he was the new husband then, um, uh, called me up one day and he said, you know, I, and he happened to be a man named Herb Schmertz, who was the vice president of Mobile Oil Company in charge of public relations. And all the money that they were putting into then public broadcasting, which you may remember in the 80s was called, uh, PBS was known as the Petroleum Broadcasting System, because most of the programs were sponsored by mobile, like Masterpiece Theater and so forth. 
He said, you know, architecture has never given any attention on television. I said, yes. He said, I think we should have a series on television. They'd done Civilization with Kenneth Clark, or they'd aired it, and so forth. I said, yes. I said, you should get Vincent Scully. He said, no, no, you should do it. I said, why should I? He said, you do a good job. So he gave me a bunch of money and, um, uh, to write up a treatment. And I did that. And he said, yes. I mean, it was the easiest job imaginable. The only thing he said is, I think you should have a few other people on the program. I said, no, I'm very entertaining. <laughs> I'm not actually on television. I'm not. I'm much more entertaining here. And um, he, he knew what he was talking about. But it took two years, basically, while I was still teaching at Columbia, still working on the office. And Tom Kligerman, um, who was a, a, a associate in the office at the time, who asked this question, uh, knows this period very well and knows the client and all that. But of course, it didn't hurt to be on eight hour, eight one hour television programs uh, broadcast or, or nationally. And you can still buy the DVDs if you want. We'll tell you how to get them. Um, <laughs> But uh, they are available. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've been lucky that way. That's great. But there were other architects on the program. Reluctantly, I let them on. Yeah. Um, how, how many residential projects do you like to keep going in the office? And how do you keep the great, you know, new, big, international or national project from sucking the talent out of the residential side of your business? Well, uh, we like to keep as many. There are three partners in the office out of seven um, who are primarily interested in residential architecture or involved with residential architecture. Uh, there are, but some of the other partners get involved with it too. It depends on personal relations uh, often. Um, people come to work for us to work on the residential projects, and different people come to work for us on the bigger projects, but we. And I like to think we encourage them to move around as they, uh, as they wish in the office. It's not as easily done. It's more easily said than done. But uh, that's how we do it. Uh, but clearly, the house projects take a lot of people, but they're, the small, but they're a small portion of the, pro of, the, of the output of the office. But they are very labor intensive. When we do a house, we do a house soup to nuts, every detail. Obsessive. So, so let's take one more question. Could you talk about how brand relates to your practice and to the marketing and the business of architecture? Well, I would say that our uh, branding, that the question, question is about branding and how it relates to our practice and how it relates to architecture. I mean, the idea of branding wasn't discussed till maybe 15 years ago, 10 mm -hmm. years. It's a, it's a relatively new concept. I don't think, you know, when, when, I, when I, let's say when I was in architecture school or a young architect, talked about a brand, it was a cigarette brand or a liquor brand or whatever. And even the names in the fashion world, I mean, Coco Chanel was alive when I was alive, you know? Um, so she wasn't a brand, she was a person. and. Uh, uh, so um, that's all changed. And now, um, I suppose, architects are branding themselves to some extent. I suppose in part because of the idea that they would like to perpetuate their businesses after they go to the um, happy uh, uh, architecture world in the sky. Um, so that, that's an issue. I mean, but I, it's a tricky one. I, I don't have the answer for it. Um, but you know, we used to be Robert A. M. Stern architects. Now we're Ramza Robert A. M. Stern architects. How did Ramza come about? Because all the consultants couldn't stand writing Robert A. M. Stern architects over and over again, so they put all the initials together and made, made us Ramza. So that's become our brand, or at least our logo. I don't know which is right, but uh, I don't have an answer for that question. But it's a good question, and people are interested in it. And, uh, but I think of all the brands where the people whose names are on them, in the, certainly in the world of fashion, have nothing to do. Oh, think of Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill. Skidmore and Owings and Merrill have been dead for 50 years or more. And that firm still survives, it has its ups and downs, depending on who is refreshing the brand by 
by good or good or not good work. So uh, that, that, that's what Mitchell Mead and White lasted well into the 19, early 1960s, long after every one of those people were uh, from that, particularly the White family, had nothing to do with the firm and objected to the use of the name. So they forced it to be changed. So, you know, these brands, quote unquote, do last. Law firms, White and Case and other firms like that, Sherman and Sterling, I should say, this goes back to the Civil War. Sterling Library and all the Sterling buildings at Yale were, the, were Sterling of Sherman and Sterling, who made all his money advising the Rockefellers and died around 1917. And yet, if you want to get a good lawyer, one of the firms to go to is Sherman and Sterling. Right. So um, I don't know if anybody out there can uh, solve our problem for us in, in branding. Please send us a card and uh, tell us what to do. Keep the fee down. <laughs> okay. I think that we'll wrap it up with that. This has been a sincere pleasure, Bob. Thank you so much. Thank you.